Good afternoon, everyone. Apologize, apologies for the for the short delay. Wanted to take this moment to thank everyone to coming to this event. And I'm going to uh, introduce our moderator, Sarah Einstein, our speakers, Esme Wang, Naomi Ortiz, and Sandra Lambert. Uh, Sarah will give you a, a, more t a more detailed bio on everyone. Just wanted to take the moment to thank you for being here and have a, have a great event. Thank you, Cynthia. And I also just wanted to take a moment to thank AWP. I'm sure all of you who are here have noticed that this year it really feels like there's a renewed effort to work toward accessibility. And, and I, for one, am, am really grateful for that and understand that working toward it is the first step to, to getting there. <laughs> Um, but please raise your hand if anything that's happening in the panel isn't working for you and you need us to make a change so that it is more accessible to you. There are accessible copies up here on the corner of the stage if you would like to follow along with the readings. Thank you. I'm going to introduce Esme Weijun Wang first. She's a novelist and essayist. She's the author of the New York Times best-selling essay collection, the Collected Schizophrenias, for which she won the Grey Wolf Nonfiction Prize. Her debut novel, The Border of Paradise, was called the best book of 2016 by NPR and one of the 25 best novels of 2016 by Electric Literature. She was named by Granta as one of the best young American novelists in 2017 and won the Whiting Award in 2018. Born in the Midwest to Taiwanese parents, she lives in San Francisco. Catherine Coldiron, writing for the Los Angeles Review of Books, says, the collected schizophrenia is a necessary addition to a relatively small body of literature, but it's also quite simply a pleasure to read. The prose is so beautiful and the recollection and description so vivid that even if it were not mostly about an under-examined condition, it would be easy to recommend. Esme Weijun Wang is poised to become a major writer and this is her origin story. Join me in greeting Esme. Okay. Schizophrenia terrifies. It is the archetypal disorder of lunacy. Craziness scares us because we are creatures who long for structure and sense. We divide the interminable days into years, months, and weeks. We hope for ways to corral and control bad fortune, illness, unhappiness, discomfort, and death, all inevitable outcomes that we pretend are anything but. And still, the fight against entropy seems wildly futile in the face of schizophrenia which shirks reality in favor of its own internal logic. People speak of schizophrenics as though they were dead without being dead, gone in the eyes of those around them. Schizophrenics are victims of the Russian word gibel, which is synonymous with doom and catastrophe, not necessarily death nor suicide, but a ruinous cessation of existence we deteriorate in a way that is painful for others. Psychoanalyst Christopher Ballas defines schizophrenic presence as the psychodynamic experience of being with a schizophrenic who has seemingly crossed over from the human world to the non-human environment because other human catastrophes can bear the weight of human narrative, war, kidnapping, death, but schizophrenia's built-in chaos resists sense. Both Gibel and schizophrenic presence address the suffering of those who are adjacent to the one who is suffering in the first place. Because the schizophrenic does suffer, I have been psychically lost in a pitch dark room. There is the ground, which may be nowhere other than immediately below my own numbed feet. Those foot-shaped anchors are the only trustworthy landmarks. 
If I make a wrong move, I'll have to face the gruesome consequence. In this bleak abyss, the key is to not be afraid, because fear, though inevitable, only compounds the awful feeling of being lost. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH, schizophrenia afflicts 1.1% of the American adult population. The number grows when considering the full psychotic spectrum, also known as the schizophrenias. 0.3% of the American population are diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. 3.9% are diagnosed with schizotypal personality disorder. I am aware of the implications of the word afflicts, which supports a neurotypical bias, but I also believe in the suffering of people diagnosed with the schizophrenias in our tormenting minds. Things had gone wrong prior to that stay during the time I spent alone in the Metairie hotel room. I'd had problems with hotel rooms earlier in 2012. Once, C took me with him to Reno on a business trip and left me in our room while he attended a conference. In his absence, a wild fear came over me. I covered the mirrors with towels when that wasn't enough to soothe me, I hid in the tiny closet. C came back. He saw the towels on the mirrors and he began to call my name. Eventually, he tried to open the closet door where I was still hiding and I emitted a small scream. Don't open the door, I whimpered. Recounting this anecdote without providing a porthole to my inner workings makes it sound like a prototypical tale of a lunatic, and I don't dispute that I was insane in Reno. I did, however, possess insight into my own situation. I'd brought my laptop into the closet with me and was coherently messaging a friend about how I'd wound up there. I'd covered the mirrors because the sight of my own face terrified me. No story accompanied the fear, no hallucinations about torn and rotting flesh, no delusions about losing my soul to the reflection. As was the case months later in Louisiana, I was overwhelmed with a sense of free-floating terror that spread like blood and congealed around vulnerable targets such as my face, the patterns in the carpet and on the bedspread, the view of dry and dusty Reno from our window. The only tenable solution was to fold myself into a small, dark place, the closet. Typing on my laptop, I tried to explain to my friend what was happening. Perhaps I was attempting to provide evidence for my side of the story, or trying to make sense of a situation that was confusing even to me, using tools that I found acceptable. The small chat window was not frightening in the same way that a face-to-face -face interaction would have been. C just came back, I typed. I'm scared. Eventually, I emerged. I was calmer, but fragile. The smallest pressure would crush me. We had no warnings of what those pressures were. When we returned to San Francisco, I went back to work. From 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday, I went to stand-up meetings and gave presentations and sat at my computer and covertly swigged from the liquor in the office pantry. I did my job. I said nothing about the horror show that was still sinking its teeth into me. Sometimes I saw things darting here and there but I ignored them. I considered myself lucky to have hallucinations that I could ignore. My psychotic symptoms were barely under control, but C and I had an upcoming trip to his parents' home in New Orleans. We discussed canceling and staying in San Francisco. We wondered if being around family during the holidays would, instead of providing more stress, 
actually be the best thing for both of us. After all, C had been my primary caretaker during this long crisis, and I suspected that spreading the responsibility among a stable group, particularly one that was loving, would ease the strain. So we flew south, watching the olive-hued swampland grow in the airplane's window, and stayed in a motel near his parents' suburban home. We fell with relief into the arms of our welcoming family. On one of those nights when the air was damp and cold, C left to watch a football game at the Superdome with his father, and I was once again alone in an unfamiliar room. I'd encouraged him to go. I was glad that he had the opportunity to do something fun without me. But his absence undid something that needed to be fastened shut, and the terror was glad to sweep in. I started gathering towels. The coherence of reality threatened to desert me. Soon my mind was a black hole, and that dead star insisted on snatching every wisp and scrap of sense. It tore at the edges of the world. After struggling with the decision to reach out, I called my mother-in-law. I told her as calmly as I could that I thought I might need to be in a hospital. All right, she said. A former hospital nurse, Ms. Gale has a soothing demeanor in times of crisis. Let's go ahead and get you sorted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esprit. Naomi Ortiz is a writer, poet, visual artist, facilitator, and the author of Sustaining Spirit, Self-Care for Social Justice. She is grounded in social justice work through community anti-violence work, disability justice, and intersectional organization within movements. Naomi is a nationally known writer, speaker and trainer on self-care, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> self-care, disability justice, and living in multiple worlds. She conducts workshops exploring self-care tools and strategies for diverse communities. Naomi has written for the Feminist Wire, Vita, Poems and Numbers, and contributed to the anthology Resistance and Hope, Essays by Disabled People. She is a disabled, mestiza, Latina, indigenous, white, raised in Latinx culture, living in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. Naomi's book, Sustaining Spirit, shows us how to balance activism with self-care by guiding readers to sink into poetic metaphor and examine their relationship to self, community, and place. Ortiz provides practical steps on how to engage in self-care every day, how to hold space for ourselves, our communities, and for the people who no long no longer with us, and how to survive in a world of pain, conflict, and uncertainty. Alice Wong, founder of the Disability Visibility Project. Help me in welcoming Naomi. So I think being a crip, and which is a term I use for myself, and doing readings is fun. Um, one of the things that is less accessible for me is holding my book while I read. So I will be reading from paper. Um, and I just like to explain that as an access thing because oftentimes we're doing all this stuff in our lives and we don't talk about the ways we make things accessible for ourselves, especially for other disabled folks that might be in the room. It's like, you got me, so um, thank you. There's this dicho or saying, ¿Y dónde está tu umbligo? which literally translates to, where is your belly button or umbilical cord? But it's a dicho, a saying that means, where are you centered or rooted? My book is about self-care for social justice activists. From my own experience doing movement work, I wanted to know, do the ways we work affect us in terms of self-care? What motivates movement elders to keep returning to the work? What do people involved in social justice brace against for support? I interviewed movement activists from all over the country and asked them questions like, what pushes you past your limits? 
Are there ways to do activist work that is sustainable? How do you connect with your body, heart, spirit, and with the place you live? In answering these questions, folks shared beautiful stories, but they also identified a lot of challenges to self-care and doing social justice work. Some of these challenges included an expectation of availability no matter the time of day, people felt overworked and undervalued, and there was an assumption that personal lives were secondary, including family. Finally, many people identified that they were participating in systems where they also experienced trauma, which was never acknowledged. Entering into an exploration of self-care, I wanted to draw from wisdom I learned from the desert and from my cultural communities as a mestiza. As a disabled person, I wanted to share about navigating life from a place of limitation. The power of limitation is embracing and developing a relationship with what we need. When we have defined limits, we have to figure out how to take care of ourselves. I collected stories from interviews and from personal experience trying to answer, how do we practice self-care in real life? And I came to believe the question, ¿Y dónde está tu ombligo? is one to answer for our survival. Where's your umbilical cord? Where are you rooted? What are you centered in? How do you draw in nourishment? The chapter I'm reading some selections from is about a situation where I was pushing for years to be a bridge between disabled folks and parents of disabled people who had a very different agenda. Um, as many of you may know in this room, disabled people, even if we are given power, we're still often out of control to define and determine what is important to us. This chapter is about the grief I felt in needing to leave my job and about seeking something to brace against. A sacred land full of stark beauty, the Painted Desert is located in the northeastern part of Arizona. Creosotes and juniper bushes speck this land, swathed in pinks, grays, yellows, and blacks. This is the sacred land of the Diné. I bring myself here because my heart has asked me to. I journey here to rest with my grief out under the sky. I desire in the deepest part of myself to make this trip alone, but the truth is I cannot make it by myself. My partner has volunteered to help me with the drive and to be a witness on this journey. We arrive at the petrified forest national park by late morning, grandfather's son already blazing heat down through the windshield of the car. Ravens seem to show up whenever I'm outside. I often hear ravens before I see them. Two ravens land near me on the wall, the third in the desert below. One of the two birds only briefly touches down before flying off, searching for something on the desert floor. The other turns to face me. It's old. I'm not sure how I know that, but I do. Raven begins squawking at me, but as hard as I listen, I have yet to crack myself open to understand what is being said. I'm frustrated knowing that there is wisdom being squawked directly at me, and yet I cannot understand. For a long time, I stare at Raven, who squawks at me. Finally, it flies off, and I return my eyes to the starkness of the landscape where I find myself alone. Grief swallows me whole, taking up home in my body, my mind, my heart and eyes. The only thing I know is that I need grace. I need a place where I can honor this transition and prepare my heart to take a direction that no one in my life understands. As the car pulls over, I spill myself out onto the pavement, collapsing on the stone wall overlooking the soft mounds of rose-hued hills. As the wind whips through my hair, I realize that drawing is out of the question. I feel like I'm losing control over my agenda and I am frustrated. Sensing I need to unleash the energy of this frustration on something other than him, my partner leaves for a walk. I open my mouth and words start tumbling out. With nothing but the hills to listen, I begin to talk to them, to tell them I am mad that it is windy and how I worked so hard to get here. Then emptier I say, I'm sad, so angry and sad. 
This is the first moment I acknowledged to myself that this sadness was what I longed to admit, to acknowledge verbally this ache that rested deep in my chest. Under the blazing blue sky stretched out in all four directions, grandfather's son is my only companion. Feeling frustrated again and unsure of what to do, I set my will to return to my original plan. I leave the trail and we drive along the flat road until we come upon the next pullout. I haul out my art supplies and clipping the paper down against the blasting wind, I begin to draw what lies before me. Tourists from all cultures pause by my chair, making the same joke that I am painting the painted desert. They all crack themselves up as they walk off to enjoy the view. I am trying not to be rude. I purse my lips and smile. I stare intently at the page. I feel like my plan is failing. Moving on down the road, we stop at a deserted picnic area. I wander a bit behind concrete picnic benches and sit on my cane chair in the middle of the sand. The sand here is the same color as the sand at home hands sprinkled with dark and light-colored stones, creating a multicolored effect. The creosote bushes here are small, and the cacti and other plants hug tightly to the ground. On the desert floor, there are deep cracks in the sand, cracks which appear only where moisture is rare. As I sit, staring at the ground, I notice an ant trailblazing a path in front of my feet. I admire the patience of the ant and wonder what it must be like to see things so close up, so large and looming, to make a way forward, never seeing the extended view of the landscape it crawls through. I feel like this ant, so keenly aware of my immediate surroundings, the deep cracks that I am navigating around, and the continual search for something nourishing, all while being unable to see the bigger picture. Grandfather's sun is beginning to settle lower in the sky and my partner is patiently waiting. I'm starting to feel panicked. The perspectives gathered are helpful, but I'm still feeling overwhelmed by grief. I need space for my blood to run, for my breath to fill, and I'm sinking under its weight. One last pull out, I say, as we drive into a scenic overlook abandoned by tourists for the moment. I bring myself to the ledge, sit, and swing my legs over to dangle above the drop-off below. I look out at the rolling hills. The light color of vegetation allows the brightly colored sands to shine in the slowly setting sun. Bright pink, orange, and red are contrasted with blacks and whites. With nothing left for me to do, I surrender to wait until I know what to do with this grief. I sit for a long time. Without realizing it, I begin to listen. I listen to what the hills have to tell me. I've spent all day listing out my reasons for why I'm angry, for why what is happening to me is unfair, for why I deserve better. These hills have listened. They know all my reasons. What do I do with this grief, I ask. You can give it to another, I hear. Without thinking, I turn to a sage bush next to where I sit. Can you take my grief, I ask? Yes, I hear, I can take your grief. Focusing on that bush, I send it all the grief I feel, all the sadness at the ways I have failed and the ways I have been failed. I take a long time pouring out the grief which filled my body out to the bush's silver gray leaves. I know without asking that taking my grief is a sacrifice, a sacrifice it was willing to make for me. We do not physically touch. I just send it everything I feel inside and I'm careful not to suck the grief, anger, sadness back in, to leave it in its graceful limbs. I feel the little bush take my grief and I trust its wisdom to know what to do with it. Thank you, I say to the bush. You're welcome, I hear it say. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Sandra Gale Lambert writes fiction and memoir that is often about the body and its relationship to the natural world. She is the author of the memoir, A Certain Loneliness, and the novel, A River's Memory. 
She is a 2018 NEA Creative Writing Fellow. Her writing has been widely anthologized and has also been published in a variety of journals, including the Paris Review, Lit Hub, the Southern Review, Brevity, the North American Review, and New Letters. She is the co-editor of the anthology Older Queer Voices, The Intimacy of Survival. Lambert lives with her wife in Gainesville, Florida, a home base for trips to her beloved rivers and marshes. In the Los Angeles Review of Books, Joanne Beard says of Lambert's memoir, I think a certain loneliness breaks very new ground and does so in an elegant, but also visceral and physical and utterly illuminating way. Disability remains one of the final frontiers for most of us until we experience it ourselves. For some reason, it is an area of life that many of us only pretend to understand until it becomes very personal. Help me welcome Sandra. So what Sarah left out was the co-editor, I'm a co-editor of the anthology Older Career Voices and Sarah is the other, is the other editor of it. <laughs> um, this is an excerpt from my memoir. I remember always seeing the underneath of things. I'm sitting on a bath rug and black and white tiles spread away from me and foreshorten into corners. Summer sunlight illuminates the soap smears and family hairs around the claw feet of the tub. It's Norwegian sunlight and has no humidity to blur the edges. Each small hair throws a shadow. The tub is deep, which means high over my head. I don't remember how I get into the tub any more than anyone who hasn't left her braces and crutches in the bedroom and crawled to the bathroom remembers how she got in a tub. But perhaps I pull myself onto a close-by toilet and then swing over to the rounded edge. It's 1966, and at 14... I'm strong and agile from a life of crutch walking. I have probably balanced the beers on the back of the toilet. Or maybe there's a table beside the tub. Yes, a table. It wavers into view, a marble square set on turned dowels of pale wood. Is this the same table that came to me when my mother died and now sits beside my bed supporting a water glass, body lotion, and always a stack of books? I do remember the black plug on a chain and the swaths of precious summer light through the window, glinting on faucets, creamy over the porcelain, slicking the tiles. It must have been a Sunday afternoon. Afternoon because of the slant of light. Sunday because of how my mouth stank with thirst. On Saturday, I would have passed for 18 in my madras skirt from the Montgomery Ward catalog and gone to bars. I don't remember that Saturday night, but mostly on a Sunday morning, I never quite remembered the night before. Although I would have caught the last before curfew bus out of the city and not missed my stop. Sometimes I remember a sloppy groping with a stranger in the back seat. Had I met him at the bar, on the bus? Perhaps on this Sunday, my lips feel bruised. I look up blackouts on the computer. Alcohol messes with the hippocampus. The hippocampus is central to the formation of new autobiographical memories. Still, I know this bath I'm remembering is in the summertime because in the winter, the light had a harder gleam as it passed through frozen glass and lasted only briefly. All of us American military families still tell tales of the blackout blinds we needed in summer to get to sleep. My mother had a story of how she sent my sister and me out the door and off to school in the winter dark and how it was dark again when we got home. So it must be summer. 
but family stories, even about astrological phenomena, can dissolve on inspection. The internet tells me the sunrise and sunset times in Oslo. Factually, it could have been summer. If so, then perhaps my mother is out on the porch when I lie to her. Our house tucks into the side of a hill and the porch hangs suspended in lilac bushes. Their tops form a perfumed privacy where my mother and the other military wives sit with their shirts off, gathering the sun over their bodies, their big white bras glowing as the women smoke. Short glasses of gin and tonic smell of lime. I watch for a while. Some of them wear shorts that fit tight over their hips and rise in a long curve high on their waist. Others have on pedal pushers that clasp their calves. They lean back in their lawn chairs. Their legs are crossed and some of them point a foot and swing, in time, swing it in time to the single on the turntable, Yellow Submarine. Earlier, a Johnny Mercer album was playing. They will tease and flirt with each other the way straight women will. My mother raises her hand and protests, no, 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 when they talk of the pilot at the last party who was always noticing when her glass was empty. He's the husband of someone who isn't here on the porch that day. Those pilots, she says, they're just full of talk. I must have wrapped my pinky and ring fingers in a sideways grip around the neck of the beer bottle and used the rest of my hand to hold on to the crutch. Mother, I say, I'm going to use beer to rinse my hair. All the girls in my class do it. I picture her turning to her friends, rolling her eyes, and simultaneously bragging and giving permission by saying, and she seems to have to use my best beer to do it. She is, of course, pleased that I'm doing something like all the other girls. She can pretend I'm one of them. She doesn't know or pretends not to know about the rotating schedule of girls' sleepovers that doesn't include me or the class-wide parties where I see everyone open their desk <clears throat> and find a colorful handmade invitation. They wave them around. I open a book and read. Sometimes one of these women on our porch makes her daughter invite me. As an adult, I can imagine the conversation that leads to the resentful, scribbled invitation thrown on my desk at school. I am beyond pride and always go when invited. But no one else in my class tells her mother she's visiting her Norwegian friends, which is sometimes true, and then sneaks downtown, sometimes with those friends, sometimes on her own, and pretends she's 18. The girls in my class would never know how to roll excuse me, how to save the last of a toothpaste tube, roll it up small, and carry it in their cleavage to use before coming in the front door at night. Sometimes my father opens my bedroom door to make sure I'm home. Prepare for inspection, inspection he calls. Yes, sir, I say. One night I'm in my slip, the toothpaste still perched there, forgotten. He sees it and says nothing. The girls in my class probably have fathers who would have asked about the toothpaste, made a scene. Sometimes I pass for 21 and I'm let into the hard liquor bars. A man will offer to buy me a drink. I ask for a gin and tonic. The women on the porch laugh and ice sounds against the glass as they drink. I turn away and swing through my crutches carefully so as not to dislodge the two other beers fitted behind my underwear's waistband. My bedroom is just on the other side of the living room at the foot of the stairway. I close the door and unwrap cramped fingers from around one beer's neck and fish the other out from under my dress. I drink one right away. My thirst settles back down inside me. I do remember the stairs, but it is, it is always the deep part of the night in my memory. I've made the mistake of having a glass of water too late 
or perhaps dinner was saltier than usual, and I can't wait until morning to pee. I crawl up the stairs backward, my elbows bent behind to lift my body. My nightgown stretches out beyond my feet until it's draped over the smooth wood and chokes against my neck with each slide of my bottom over a step, each bump of my heels. Midway, on the landing, I pause in the darkness before starting the steep rise to the second floor. At the top, I crawl past the snoring of my father and then the silence behind my sister's door. Sometimes, she climbs down the fire ladder to roam outside at night. So I don't remember crawling to the bathtub on this day. I don't remember how I brought the beers with me. I remember the hot water, the bubble bath, and my body swirled with steamy iridescence. Iconic memory, echoic memory, haptic memory, visual, oral, and tactile. Researchers have words for it all. The yeasty beer sweating in the steam, the glass cool against my palm. I tilt the bottle over my head until I fear, feel beer against my scalp. I work it through my hair so the lie will pass inspection. Then I lean against the sloped back of the tub and finish the bottle. Alongside the beer waiting on the table that may or may not be there and may or may not have become my bedside table is my mother's razor. She has forbidden me to use it. I'm too young, she says. My mother and her friends have legs that look like silk as they move easily among each other. I prop a heel against the edge of the tub. I lather the length of my leg and shave for the first time. A tendril of blood curves down from my knee, but a quick swish of the razor clears the evidence from the blade. I splash the blood and loose hairs off my leg and inspect it in the sunlight. The scars of old surgery shine brighter next to the bared skin. The twist of a lower bone makes a different pattern of light and shadow than the legs that flowed up into shorts. I rub, rub along the new smoothness of skin, and it is like silk. This is how it would feel to touch one of those women's legs. This is how it would feel to someone touching me. I open the waiting beer and let the now warm copper-colored liquid slide inside me. A whisper from the future murmurs gentle, blurred words that I can't understand, but it comforts me that there is a future. I tilt the bottle and drain out the last of the beer. I put it back on the table that may or may not be there and soap my other leg down to where the water line circles my thigh. Thank you. Thank you. In a second, we'll have time for questions, but I also wanna take a moment to thank the activists who helped to make sure that this panel could happen, and to take note of the fact that not all of them can be here because access isn't perfect yet. And they may not be able to be here because access to the conference isn't available to them, or access to transportation to the conference, or access to adequate housing or transportation once they're in the city of the conference. And there are a number of them, and I think that we should just take a moment to note their continued absence and the continued need for activism until we can all be here together. I'm going to ask a question first and then I'm going to invite you to ask questions. I will repeat them back, but I will ask if you're sitting in the back to, to speak loudly or to raise your hand and ask someone to come to you uh, for help asking your question so that we make sure we hear it and get it right. But first, I would like to ask the panelists, can you tell us what you're working on now? What are your current projects? And when might we expect to see them? Are we going in order here? Sure. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> um, I'm working on a second novel. Um, the protagonist is uh, dealing with a mysterious chronic illness. Um, it deals with uh, emotional abuse and um, 
the impact of a uh, of a difficult uh, and a, a difficult election. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, a lot, there's a lot of stories in my book, both for myself and from folks I interviewed, all trying to look at how to kind of gather up like little skills um, to practice self-care. And uh, so there's like questions at the end of all the chapters. And one of the things I've been doing that I've been really enjoying and hope to do more of is uh, workshops around the book and around the idea of how to incorporate self-care. Um, there was a workshop a couple of weeks ago where an elder, we we're talking about um, how, what, what we center in our core. And so we are kind of playing with the image around if we were a tree and centering ourselves as the trunk and the limbs and our communities and the things we care about are the leaves. And so we have the capacity to shed them if we need to, um, even though we also feed them with our own our own, you know, life. Uh, and so there's an elder in the room and she was saying that she actually consciously makes a decision to shed her leaves periodically and that this conscious decision is something that freaks her out every time she decides to do it, but she does it and, she's a, and she declared, I live my life like a deciduous tree. Mm -hmm. And she shared this with the group and it was just like in that moment, I'm like, we have so much wisdom collectively that we, you know, when we take the moment to like sit down and actually have like maybe an honest and vulnerable conversation with each other, it's really beautiful to witness and be part of. So I've been feeling privileged to do that and been really enjoying doing that. Santa. Oh, I had the same reaction as they did. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did. There was a long time between when my, um, when this book was finished and before it was published, like years. So I did write a novel in that time that I'm shopping around that is uh, post-environmental catastrophe with a disabled lesbian womanizing character. And it has, you know, it has mystery and thriller and, you know, it's different. And it actually has a plot, which is different for me. And um, so, but, I don't have, you know, I'm, I have lots of, I have lots of excuses. These are all my excuses. Uh, you know, you, you're out promoting your book. You don't have time to sink into a big project. Um, the day that my advanced readers copies came when this last summer was also when I had been diagnosed with breast cancer and had a lumpectomy and then 10 days later had a heart attack and then 10 days later had a, some other serious medical thing. So I am playing the cancer card as far as I'm not working on a big project yet, but that's getting thin. And certainly um, my partner is over me playing that card. I'm over <laughs> playing that card. It's time for me to, I don't know, revise the novel or start something new, but I, I just don't know yet. And maybe a new book of essays, we, we'll see. Also, because I happen to know Sandra really well, she's my conference wife, I've read the novel and and she should still be shopping that. It's really good. <laughs> right. Do you guys have any questions? Yes. Okay. So, okay, I, I, have, I probably have to phrase this a little bit. But, um, if you'll stop after each phrase, I'll repeat it so everybody can hear. Okay, yeah. He says, I probably have to frame this a little bit. I have cerebral palsy, and I really like comic books. I have cerebral palsy, and I really like comic books. And there's a Marvel series out right now with a character that has CP. And the writer of it contacted me and wanted me to workshop a script. And the writer of it contacted him and wanted him to help workshop a script. And so I did, and I'm getting special thanks credit for it in a couple of weeks when it comes out. And so he did, and he's getting special thanks credit for it in a couple of weeks when it comes out. And he feels like he's mostly unassisted unless he wants to use his cane. But the character uses a wheelchair and crutches. And I, I don't really feel like, it's not an expertise thing, but sometimes I feel like, especially when I'm in a classroom and I'm the only disabled person. 
And it's not an expertise thing, but sometimes he feels like when he's in a classroom and he's the only disabled person. I feel like I need to talk about disability issues, even though it's not a long list, but I don't really feel like I can. How do you deal with that? He feels like he needs to talk about disability issues, even though it's not a monolith. Could you repeat the last part? How do you, like, how, how do you guys deal with that? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, so one of the ways that I deal with that is I kind of try to make it bigger than me because obviously like my experience can't speak to everybody's experience. So I talk a lot about um, often the um, definition of ableism and the definition that I use a lot is there's a lot of, it, it's grounded in a fear of vulnerability. And so sometimes when I feel like I'm called on to talk about something very specific and it's oftentimes people wanting I don't know, to be like nosy in a way that doesn't feel right, you know, like you feel it inside, you're like, eh. Um, making it bigger and holding this idea of like, so let's talk about a fear of vulnerability. Pe people, oh, okay, <laughs> you know. So I think it helps a little bit with having a deeper discussion or a bigger discussion where I'm not like, I'm telling you how it is for all disabled people. So I don't know if you all have. That seems perfect. All right. I'm going to use that. Yes, please. <laughs> Another question? She has a question for Naomi, but also the panel at large. So Naomi works in self care. But self care as a concept has been kind of co opted by capitalism. <laughs> How do you deal with that? <laughs> oh yeah. Sometimes I feel, especially in spaces where I go in and um, I'm like, yeah, I write about self-care for social justice activists. And like, I see the, I feel the mm -hmm. eye roll. Like, and I'm like, yeah, bubble baths don't work for me. I would be taking my life in my hands. So let's have a different conversation. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of pushback I get in talking about self-care uh, um, in that way. and. Um, one of the, one of the ways that I've tried to, again, frame it as a bigger picture is that self-care is what a lot of us need to actually just survive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, and I'm not the first nor the last to say that, but I think that, you know, saying it, it's like you feel it in your body and then you know it's true. And so when a lot of us live in ways where we live interdependently and kind of messy ways where we can't just like separate ourselves. I feel like a lot of the kind of commercial advice is like, you pull yourself away, you drop all your relationships, you make your own decisions, and then you know you can be in charge of your life. And that's just not reality for a lot of us. And so, you know, countering that, and then also um, bringing in an idea of self-care as something that's spiritual and you know, that's kind of a loaded word, but for me, that often means like it's bigger than me and it's like I get to tap into things that are bigger than me and it helps me maybe not feel so alone. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the ways that I sort of counter the, not that taking a bubble bath and drinking a glass of wine is bad, mm -hmm. but just, you know, it's like not accessible to me. So I'd like to offer things that might be a little more accessible to other folks too. And. I my uh, my friend Michelle, who's disabled and a really great writer and is a dear friend, and said, oh, I read this great book. It was Naima's book. You should read it. And she, I said, well, what's it about? And she told me a little bit. I said, Michelle, I hate self-care books. You hate self-care <laughs> books. What are you saying here? And she's, no, read this book. And, you know, I read it and loved it very much. It was a little different. Yeah, yeah, did your friend describe it in a different way? I'm just curious. No, she just is bossy and told me to just read it. And you know, yeah. you have friends that you just, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, no, I, I just, that, that whole idea of self-care as survival really resonated yeah. with me because I, um, uh, something that has come up um, People often tell me that they've learned a lot about self-care from me, mm -hmm. um, and I find this hilarious because <laughs> I used to be very, very bad at self-care, and so um, 
But I think that uh, I learned I learned to be good at self care and self care as survival meaning, you know. Uh, and I loved what you said about self care not necessarily being a form of isolation or a form of you know just like just me me me. But like often you know involving the community or you know like that so much of the my self care looks like involving community or involving, you know, my close friends or, you know, et cetera. Um, but uh, so much of my learning to become better at self-care was because I had to, was because I got, I started to become really sick. And um, if I hadn't learned to become better at self-care, I wouldn't have survived that, yeah. that some of the worst years of my life. Um, and you really learn, um, that things like, for example, like rest are important. You know, I think like so much of um, self-care, at least for me, is like learning that like how much capitalism wants you to not do self-care, um, yeah. wants you to learn that driving yourself into the ground um, is the way to go. Um, I wrote this piece for L. Um, a, a number of years ago that still somehow manages to cycle back every once in a while because it seems to resonate with a lot of people that um, it's called something like I'm chronically ill and afraid of being lazy um, mm -hmm. but a lot of oh, people seem to resonate with it <laughs> because it because of I wrote it though because I it, it kept coming back to me I kept like you know, I would feel very sick, you know, and I, but I would like it, I would feel like, oh, why am I not working more? Um, and um, yeah, that the, all of this rambling, rambling is to say that um, self-care is a lot more than, than what it may seem to be when you look at like goop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, How many that, people were secretly thinking of goop and rolling? <laughs> and, and it's that, about oh, good. process. Oh, yeah. I was just going to yeah. say, it's about yeah. process. It's yeah. about figuring out, you know, little, like, what do you need in a moment? That's actually a really hard question to grapple with. And so figuring stuff out like that sometimes can break things down to a very small. Even like taking a deep breath if you can, you yeah. know, it's something like that. I'm sorry, did you? That's, the word lazy just, yeah. you know, when I was moving from all those years of using braces and crutches to a wheelchair, yes. I, you know, the guy is fitting me for a wheelchair. It was a manual at that time. He's saying, mm, you gotta be careful not to get lazy, mm, yeah. you know, and, Anyway, <laughs> and I think that relates the whole that we're supposed to be uh, productive in a certain type of way mm -hmm. to our in our society. Yes, Lynn. So it's kind of plays off of that, which is in our society, a lot of people view people with disabilities. Okay, so it kind of plays off of that in our society, a lot of people view people with disabilities. As being less than or incapable. And so I'm curious about how you all reconcile. And so I'm curious about how you all reconcile. That in your head with your very realistic limitations. That in your head with your very realistic limitations. And the knowledge that you are powerful and you are capable. And the knowledge that you are powerful and you are capable. I had polio um, as a baby in the 50s, and we were a generation, the po people that had polio, we were called the John Waynes of the disability movement. We, um, we succeeded, we were type A's, we had um, higher rates of marriage, we earned more money than able-bodied people, we had higher educations, we were strivers. The, bargain we made to be able to be considered in those ways was that we never complained. We never whined. We never said we hurt. We never said we can't do that. We pretended that I pretended, you know, despite using braces and crutches, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't disabled. I didn't use that. I mean, I knew I was disabled. Okay. But I had this headset now then post polio kicked in and I had to reverse all of that. And it was, it was a, 
very difficult and very magnificent time in my life, those changes. Uh, um, to um, not be, despite, be who I was despite disability, but to just get in the mud of it and roll it around and enjoy it and f fling it over other people. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. that, that has been a wonderful transition in my life. Yeah, I, I actually wrote an entire blog post about this, and I'm trying really hard to remember everything I said in it <laughs> uh, so that I can kind of regurgitate it now. Um, I, I've dealt with a lot of self-confidence issues um, since I became less able to do things that I used to be able to do. Um, I've always dealt with some form of disability due to uh, mental health issues. Um, but then um, became quite ill and then dealt with more physical forms of disability since then, and then that became difficult. But I, I realized that my self sense of self-confidence was really suffering um, ap after I became less able to do certain things. Um, and that was really hard, and I think that... Um, Part of that was um, letting myself feel it and not trying to kind of um, bulldoze my way through the emotions and pretend that they weren't happening, um, but also reminding myself of who I still am. Um, I still am, you know, a person who likes apple pie and likes to write and you know there are things that I you know find more difficult now um, I can't sit at a laptop and write for seven hours the way I used to but I do lie in bed and tap on my iPhone and that's how I wrote this book um, and um, so I you know I find different ways to do the things that I um, used to do. Um, and some things I find much harder or some things that I just can't do. And that's a grieving process. And a lot of things about disability do involve grieving. And that's something that is um, hard to talk about. And I think that's also an important conversation. Um, but yeah, there are also ways to um, I don't know, find work for hands too. Yeah, thank you. I think that for me, the, there's a couple of things. One is that disability can be so isolating. I mean, I don't know about the communities you all come from. I live in Tucson. It's, a, you know, it's about the size of Portland, but it doesn't have good sidewalks. And so, you know, trying to get out and connect and be part of community, even like literary community or other kinds of communities is really challenging. Um, and so one of the things that I am incredibly grateful for very early on because I was doing activist work and anti-violence work and I was working in prison systems and with young people and got connected to disability activists um, that were organizing around the country. And that's how I got to learn about disability. Like, obviously I was, you know, disabled before that, but like disability in the sense of like, so to me, disability means community. That's oftentimes how I connect to it is like, a bunch of people who are really different from each other and figuring out how to like be together and figuring out life. And even though we might be kind of segregated in where we live or alone in where we live, we can connect. So that's one piece of it. And I think the other piece of it for me is around being a mixed person. So I'm racially mixed. I'm first generation American on one side. I have like some very complicated um, cultural history and, um, you know, I think that integrating disability as part of that mixture of like things that just don't fit, like everywhere I go, <laughs> uh, has been really helpful. So I feel like, you know, you can't talk about, for me, I can't talk about being disabled without talking about my cultural identities. And I can't talk about my cultural identities without talking about disabled, be, being disabled, because those things are so all part of me. And this inner negotiation of how to just show up and be myself the best of my ability, but yeah, take that deep breath and do it. So that's, I think, how it. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, Matt. 
In the hat? Put your hands up. Is there any specific particular advice? Is that, that you would give to disabled writers about entering the publishing industry and interest entering the writing industry and publishing work? I am autistic and I just wrote my first novel about my special interests. However, the subject is oddly specific and bizarre. And I worry that at least in literature or literary fiction, I'm sorry, there is a stigma against low empathy autistics, a subject I address in my novel. Do you have advice? That's real. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, just shortly for myself, I actually, I think because my book was a little bit weird because it was like nonfiction slash help help self help slash you know centered around like disability and cultural uh, identities and um, it didn't really fit anywhere. And I also really struggled with wanting to uh, work with a press who got where I was coming from. And so I actually ended up going through a very small press um, called Reclamation Press, and they're a disability-run press, and they're, they're very new. Um, they've published, uh, Raymond uh, was, yeah, is also published through them, who is also presenting today, um, and, and Selena Depak. De um, so there's, there's a couple of presses out there that like are run by us and maybe are willing to, you know, have a deeper conversation about things that other presses just might automatically reject. And I also feel like, especially if you're going to be kind of breaking new ground, it's important to be with a press and an editor who you feel understands your project and what you're trying to do with your, your book. Um, yeah. And then there's the basic, the, there's the basic always be working to make your writing better. That is for everyone. And um, I don't. I don't have any academic background in writing at all. So that meant I was very ignorant of the literary world, and I, so I didn't know that um, that people like me don't apply to these things. That people like me don't submit to these places or with my type of writing. And I just did anyway, and I got some acceptances, and I built on those. So I wouldn't make assumptions that. Um, there's a closed door. I, there are, but um, there's no reason to make assumptions about that, to keep trying to submit and to always be um, reaching out to places and people where you can make your writing better and better. All right. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Uh, so thank you guys very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank AWP for making this possible. Great. Yay. Thank you. And let's hope it's possible for even more people next year. Yay. Yay. <laughs>